it, it comes from my mother. She was very much like everything we do in this world is a choice. She was like, the only thing I have to do in my life is stay black and die. Those are the only two things that are in my life that are going to be consistent, right? Like everything else is what you choose. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode 132. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have an interview with Marla Renee Stewart. I think you mean an awesome interview. Well, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) No, this is its seriously awesome, and we are super excited to be bringing this to you, Marla is a badass in so many ways and we actually have her bio in front of us and we're going to read from it so we don't miss any of the things that she does because there's a lot of them so if this sounds scripted it is marla is a professional sexologist intimacy relationship sex coach speaker and author she is the owner of velvet lips and a sexuality education company as well as contract liberation a company focused on research for nonprofit groups as a lecturer at clayton state university she teaches sociology and women's and gender studies as the co-founder of the sex down south conference marla aims to bring diverse groups together to learn and share their experiences in the essence of being authentic and fostering sexual liberation across communities and because that's not enough. She also just wrote a co-wrote her first book, uh, The Ultimate Guide to Seduction and Foreplay with Dr. Jessica O'Reilly. And that came out earlier this year. So go check that out. There will be links to all of the things that she does and all of the things that you can find her involved in in the show notes, including dates for Sex Down South, which this year is moving virtual in September on September 10th to 12th. And so all of those details are coming soon and links will be in the show notes. So you're going to want to stay tuned. Yeah, this isn't, <laughs> and, and by far, this is not just a commercial for her stuff. The amount of amazing things that she talks about is just incredible. So please stick around for the conversation. First, a few quick announcements. Community announcements, we're going to go over really quickly, and more information will be in the outro. We had our monthly virtual meet and greet last week, and it was fantastic. Yeah, we had like 26 people. Yeah. 26 people logged in, and it was awesome. People were witty and lots of banter, so I thought you said we were going to be short about we, this. That's what All you right. t- <laughs> That's my bad. I'll take the blame. The next one is going to be on July 23rd. Again, more information in the outro. We also have our Patreon Q&A and our women's group calls coming up this month. Our women's group call is on July 21st and the Patreon Q&A is on July 29th. So again, come back and listen to the outro or go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com to find out more. Will you let me talk about it more in the outro? Maybe. (laughs) I ruined it, didn't I? You did. All right, a quick word from our new sponsor, Alt Playground. Uh, Alt Playground, if you're not familiar yet, if you're not a member yet, first of all, why not? But Go se- check it out. Second of all, it is a open-minded community of awesome people looking to meet other open-minded, sex-positive, awesome people. And let's just say they're meeting to see if they've got a connection. We'll call, yeah. it, we'll call it a dating site like, for open-minded, sexually dating. adventurous people. <laughs> I was wondering if you're going to get to the dating part. Yeah, well, I mean, it's dating. It's just hanging out. Who knows what it is? Yeah, it could be a friendships, too. But one of our favorite parts about Alt Playground is how inclusive they are. And, uh, for example, they have nine different gender identities you can pick from, nine different relationship statuses you can pick from. Eight relationship types and 13 sexual orientations. So this is this really is a community for all uh, all types of sex positive individuals. Yes. Let's just say it's <laughs> inclusive. 
And you're going to want to check it out. And you're going to want to check out all of the badass people that you can meet over there. To go check it out, you can go to altplayground.net or you can go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com and find the links. Find the links? (laughs) Find the links. (laughs) Nailed it. (laughs) I got it. (laughs) We're going to get demoted. (laughs) All right, we will, and with that, just about ready to let you go listen to Marla. But we did want to remind people, if you have determined that it's time to go start meeting other sexy people in real life, and we are not the coronavirus police here, but remember, if you're going to do that, uh, you still need to get tested for STIs. So you can get $10 off your STI panel using STD Check. We haven't mentioned them in a while, mostly because of coronavirus. But we wanted to remind you that you can get that discount on our website. Normalizingnonmonogamy.com. And it is honestly the way that we get tested uh, usually two to three times a year each. It's super easy. It's all online. Well, you got to go get your blood taken in person. It's tough to do that over the internet. But yes, it's awesome and we use it and highly, highly recommend it. So go check that out. And if you want to say hello to us, reach out, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Say I was, hello. I was also going to say, by using the links on our webpage for SE Check, you do support the show. So we thank you for that. Yes, we do. Thank you so much. And now we will stop talking at you and let Marla talk with you. Yeah, let's go. Well, welcome, Marla. We're super excited to have you on the show. And I'm so glad that yeah, you made time for us on a Saturday. And we made it happen fast. So. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Anytime that, you know, I can share my story, get it out there, I'm definitely, you know, make time for it. So yeah. so thanks again for for accommodating me. No, we're, we're, we're honored. So do you mind, for anybody who's not familiar with Marla, taking us maybe through a little bit of who you are, and then we can jump into maybe what non-monogamy kind of looks like for you and take it from there. Yeah, sure. So I am Marla. I am a sexologist, a sex coach, educator, author, speaker, all of those things. I run my own sexuality education business called Velvet Lips, where I do workshops, sex coaching for clients and help people build up their sexual confidence, enhance their communication and their sex skills and all of the things. And I also am one of the co-founders for the Sex Down South Conference, uh, which is a three-day conference that focuses on sex and sexuality learning. So we have fun during the day. I mean, I'm sorry. We learn during the day. So all sorts of different workshops. And then we have fun. We do have fun during the day, though. I, was I, was say, like, fun. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. We're talking about sex, sexuality. Of course, it's fun. And then, you know, we have fun party at night and whatnot. So it's a really fun experience. It's in Atlanta every year. And we just, we have a good time. It's like a family reunion all the time. And it, it's really for people who who want to know more and want to enhance their sex life and just want to get better at being, you know, better people in the world. You know, it's our, it's our version of, of pleasure activism. Yeah. And I also teach at a university, uh, which is about 20 minutes South of downtown Atlanta called Clayton state. And I teach in the department of interdisciplinary studies. Uh, I teach two classes a semester uh, I teach women's and gender studies and sociology. So I teach everything from like gender and sexuality to marriage and family to sociology of sports, women in sports. I was a college athlete. So I teach that as well. Feminist theories, all sorts of stuff. And yeah, I sit on the board of Spark Reproductive Justice now. I am the board treasurer. <laughs> <laughs> And that is an organization that focuses on helping uh, Black women and LGBTQ uh, youth leadership in the reproductive justice realm. So that is sort of like my professional (laughs) accolades, you know. That's it? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I think so. I mean, I might can conjure up a few more things, but we'll we'll limit it. No, it's amazing. I don't... I, I... I'm in awe of how you find time to do anything else. Um, so it's thank you so much again for coming on the show. And maybe do you mind taking us back or into what what does non-monogamy look like or how do you approach non-monogamy? And then maybe we can go back and figure out how you got how you got here. Yeah. So non-monogamy has always I have always, not have, have I always experienced it. I think when I grew up as a, you know, in high school, I kind of didn't, 
you know, it was very traditional. I, I lived near a military base, so I was around a lot of military families, very multicultural, a lot of mixed race people and families. And when I got to college is when I was like, oh my goodness, like there is so much more to the world. And I just, I, I think I was just sort of sheltered, you know, when I was younger. It was just sort of like a... a I lived in Sacramento or a, a, a suburb of Sacramento called Antelope and it is a cow town. So where I lived, there were lots of cows. My friends went cow tipping, right? In high school. <laughs> so, you know, it's mean. Um, I mean, of course they tried to do it. They could never do it, but, <laughs> and I came out to my parents at 16 and I came out as bisexual. So I had my first boyfriend at 16. And then I had my first girlfriend also at 16. So it was in the same year. My mom was just going crazy. <laughs> and, yeah, I bet that was a lot. Of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just like a teenage, you know, a teenage daughter, but then dealing with like, I mean, she's just like, oh my gosh, like so much change. <laughs> right, right. She's like, I don't know what to do. Um, so when I got, when I was graduating high school, I got recruited to play basketball for San Francisco State. And I did not know San Francisco was where all the gays were, right? And so I mentioned to one of my friends, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go, you know, play basketball for this NCAA D2 school in San Francisco. And they were like, oh, watch out for Castro, Castro Street. And I was like, what is that? Like, that almost sounds scary, you know? And I wasn't out to any of my friends, by the way, in high school. So I was only out to my parents and maybe like one or two friends. Wow. That's like, that's unusual as far as like, you know, being out to your parents first over your friends. Yeah. 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 And so, and I was super popular. So I knew a lot of people and a lot of people knew me. So it was just very much I didn't know what to do with the information. So it wasn't necessarily, it was a secret, but I didn't know really why it needed to be a secret. So then I got to San Francisco. Oh, my friend uh, goes, Oh, you know, watch out for the Castro. And I was like, mom, what goes on? What's happening in the Castro? And she was like, that's where all the gays hang out. And, and uh, I was like, Oh, I was like, that is a thing. Right. And she was just like, yeah, little does he know he doesn't know anything about you. So he's, he doesn't know that you probably would go there. Right. <laughs> and so I was like, Oh, wow. Okay. So being in San Francisco just opened up my eyes completely about ways you could be, how you could be authentic in who you truly are and in yourself and, you know, all the things that make up you. And I had some really wonderful professors and I was studying human sexuality. And in my variations in human sexuality class, there was a section on all the variations of human sexuality and what that looks like. And that year he came out, he was 72 years old, I believe my professor. And it was the first year that he had come out and said that he was gay and so it was like this huge deal because he had been doing sexuality research for, I don't know, 50 years or whatever it is. And then finally felt comfortable enough to come out. So I was like, this, this, there's no other way than to be authentic. Cause in my head, I, I registered that being authentic in who you are and being just saying who you are, will you can access the things that you need to access. So I never, ever felt limited in who I was and what I wanted to do. And so when I got to college, I was just like, I'm, I'm dating. And I dated everybody. You know, I was like dating. When I first got there, I think I was dating this guy from the baseball team. It was like a total drunk. I was dating like some girls on my basketball team. I mean, like I was just like, I this is just dating. Like I'm not, I have the, I have the ability to not be with one person. So I, you know, I'm dating, I'm filling my way out and you know, whatever it is. So that, you know, in and of itself being going to college, understanding what non-monogamy was figuring out like, Oh, Hey, I like this. And then, you know, uh, being able to do that. Right. 
So. And it sounds like your it sounds like your mom, although it was probably a crazy time for her, was fairly supportive of everything. Yeah, she definitely freaked out at first. My parents both did. They, uh, you know, my dad didn't talk to me. He took me to every single basketball game. And I think I had like three basketball games in a week because I was like, you know, in those special leagues. And he didn't talk to me for two weeks, didn't take me to my game. So that was like, I was really sad about that. But I was like, it was two weeks, two weeks out of my life, right? Like, not a big deal. And then my mom, she, she's the one that like, doesn't know something, so needs to research all about it, which is probably where I get that from. So she was just like, oh, my God, I got to go to PFLAG meetings. I like she <laughs> she gave me like, you know, gay and lesbian newspapers. She handed me a lesbian sex pamphlet and was like, I don't know what they do, but here, be safe, you know. <laughs> And so as a teenager, you're embarrassed. I was just like, oh, my God, like, yeah, you know, but in this, she was a very sex positive parent as I would understand it now. Then I did not really get it, but now I get it. And I'm so happy because she just really trained me on what it means to be a sexually responsible adult. And, you know, I can't thank her enough for that. That's awesome. And it sounds like your dad... He put, he put you in time out for two weeks and then was like, <laughs> well, this isn't worth it. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was an, like an all-star athlete. I had, I was on a roll. I was one of the most popular students in school. I sang the star spangled banner at every rally. I was like rally captain. I like, it was, you know, I played three sports a year. So my parents to be upset would be, they were kind of like, we have this like really overachieving child. We like, I was like, what are you going to do? Put me on the street. Like I was that kind of cocky as a kid. Well, and I'm curious, you said you made the comment earlier that you knew it was a secret, but you didn't know why it had to be a secret. Had they, had they asked you to keep it a secret or was that just you not wanting to share it with the whole school? Yeah. I think I just didn't know what that looked like. I, I, it was during the time that Ellen got kicked out of, kicked off of her show. So it was like, I saw the repercussions of someone coming out, um, negatively. And then when I got to college, I saw the repercussions of someone coming out and it being positive and being like, okay, bad things can happen, but also good things can happen. So when your professor came out, yeah. 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 So it was just kind of like, okay, there's two different reactions here. What is it better to be in hiding or is it better just to live your truth? Right. You know? And and so as you moved through year one of college, there was a lot mm-hmm. of different experiences. Then how did it how did it progress from there? Yeah. So as I I just kept that attitude of dating multiple people. So even so I did get into some monogamous relationships. And then when I got to Atlanta for graduate school, I was just like, I don't think I want to do that anymore. And I I ended up uh so I had a girlfriend at the time and we were We had opened up our relationship. She had moved here from California to be with me in Atlanta. And it was just, we had an open relationship. So we, we negotiated those terms, what that looked like, had our, you know, what our boundaries were. And in my previous, in in, in my relationships since then had also been non-monogamous. So my relationship after that was also a non-monogamous relationship with a woman um, where we would play with other women and other people, but there really weren't, it wasn't polyamorous. And so I think my first, so that was, it was sort of like a, a polyamorous experience because she started to develop um, feelings for, um, another woman. And so they were kind of having this relationship and we had a don't ask, don't tell policy. So it was just sort of like, you do your thing. I was more interested in my business. Like my business was my, my, my partner in life. So (laughs) I was really focused. I was just like, go ahead, do what you do, what you want to do, be safe. And, you know, and then I had relationships after that were kind of were monogamous, and they were okay. 
They were all right. Um, I, I think people don't listen. So when I tell people I'm a non, non-monogamous person, I think people are like just convinced that they can get you to be monogamous. And so it's kind of like, mm, I'm only monogamous if I wanted to be monogamous. Otherwise, like, it, I don't think it's necessarily like in my nature. And I think part of that is I am like a, a compersive person, right? Like I love to see when I've seen my partners engage with other people, I'm just like, Oh my gosh, this is so exciting. Oh, like, like keep it, go- keep it going, you know? <laughs> and I would say my, uh, last polyamorous relationship was when I had two partners, one was long distance and the other one was local. And so I had been with the long distance one for about a year and the short, shorter one was only for maybe a few months. And then I was like, oh, we're not, we're, we're done with that. So yeah, it was, that's sort of, yeah, been my journey around non-monogamy. Yeah. Right. One of, one of the things you said when you had your, one of your first sort of relationships that you would sort of say we were in an open relationship that you had negotiated everything, what the terms were, how that was going to look. I'm just curious, how did you learn to have those conversations and those negotiations? Because I think there's a lot of people who even after doing it for years, struggled to do that. And you were doing it on one of the first, yeah. your first times at bat. I feel I, like it's like you, you honestly make it sound easy. Right. <laughs> and I think that people don't, don't always experience that. Yeah. I, I think part of that is like, you have to know who you are and know your truth and who you are and be confident in it. And I think a lot of people, especially with my clients, my non-monogamous clients, that they sometimes are like, I'm not really sure if this is, uh, what are the consequences? Da, 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 da. They're like, they think so much about another person that they're sacrificing their own well-being. And that is something I think I refuse to do. Like if I cannot take care of myself, then I cannot take care of other people. So when I'm in a situation like that, or when I'm in a situation where I am trying to negotiate things, I just, I just have to be, it's a, it's a hard conversation for people who are not used to that conversation. But I, it's, for me, it's a first date thing. Like I have to say it, this is who I am. If this, uh, if this, if this is something that is not going to mesh with you, then, you know, we can keep it moving. Yeah. And I am, I'm out. I'm proud. I am, I am who I am. I'm a out proud queer person. And it's just like, even for me, I was, I went on a date with this couple and it was, uh, it was interesting. It was, so it was, a, it was two women and they were looking for a third partner. And so I was like, Oh, that's interesting. I'm gonna go on this date. Like, you know, they're cute. And so I went on the date with them and one of them was like, Oh, I just bought a house and it's really nice, but, um, I'm not out to my family. So you would basically either have to be a roommate or you would have to leave for however long my family would be in town or there or something like that. And I was like, Oh no, I'm not doing that. Like (laughs) I am way too old for that. Like, you know, I I came out at 60. There's no way you're not trying to like tuck me back in a closet somewhere. So things like that, where people just aren't, they expect you to be who you aren't. I think Um, people often come with their, representative, right? The person they want to impress. They have all these like, I'm going to do this and this and this with my life. And uh, instead of actually like, I am right here in in this moment in my life right now. And I think, yeah, that's the, I I think that's the key is just being able to say it on the first date, not waiting until the third date or the fifth date or six months just like say who you are. If you know you are a non-monogamous person, just say it. Yeah. Yeah. And it probably it goes for any any aspect of who you are, right? right. Not just mm-hmm. the non-monogamy, but anything, right? Maybe it's kink. Maybe it's something that you, you maybe not all kinks, right? Or just there's probably some things that are okay to wait for the third day. But if there's something that is ingrained in who you are, don't be afraid to, to share that. Yeah. And so so maybe a follow-up question on that is, there's probably a lot of people saying, well, that's easy for you to say, right? How, how did you, 
maybe how how did you find that confidence to i mean from a very young age be the person who's just like i'm going to be me unapologetically and i don't care what you think or you think or anybody thinks this is me and i'm going to go forth in the world and do that lessons from my mother <laughs> you know <laughs> like <laughs> I, I think it, it, it's, it, it comes from my mother. She was very much like everything we do in this world is a choice. She is like, the only thing I have to do in my life is stay black and die. Those are the only two things that are in my life that are going to be consistent, right? Like everything else is what you choose. And she just, she taught me just a lot of lessons just around like how to be and, and be kind and be, you know, myself. And, and it sounds yeah. like that was, it, that was ingrained in her too. Yeah. Well, it wasn't. So my, I, I believe my mother, my mother made a conscious decision to leave where she was at. She was, um, abused as a child. She saw some really horrific things. Um, she was pregnant with me as a teenager. So I think there were things that happened in her life where she was just like, I am going to shift what my future generations are going to look like. I do not want my daughter to grow up in this world that I have been living in. So I was born in East St. Louis, Illinois. And the day after I turned one, my mom took me on a plane to California and was like, I am not living that life anymore. So she wanted me to have a good life. Um, Yeah. She was brave. Yeah. Yeah. So the lessons she learned, I think just came from her. She was in college. She got into college, you know? So I think the lessons that she learned from college were things that she definitely instilled in me and, and being authentic and being who I was and, and, um, you know, yeah. just being a good person. Right. Yeah. And it sounds like you were fortunate enough too to have a lot of other influences. Like you mentioned your professor coming out and watching that and like going as you grew up and went through college and all of those experiences, you know, I'm, I'm sure that those shaped who you were, you know, as they all do, as uh, that all of our experience do It's you know, that I'm sure that helped. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, Definitely. So I, again, Emma said earlier that you, it sounds like it's just been easy, right? Like (laughs) you're so positive and you're like, yeah, I just do what I want. And I tell people who I am and then I'm happy. Like, have there been struggles or things that you've come up against that have been difficult that you've had to overcome? Oh, for sure. I remember when um, I was in this relationship and again, at the beginning, I said, I am a non-monogamous person and I like to be with other people. However, that looks like maybe in a relationship we can talk about, you know, and I was in this relationship and I think it was maybe a year and a half or maybe a year had gone by and he was just, you know, like he, he, he just, did he propose? I'm all like, maybe he proposed. And then (laughs) I'm trying to remember like the order. I like, I don't remember the order of it all. Like, I think he proposed. And then I was like, okay, that's great. And also like, I haven't been with anyone since I've been with you and I'm, I'm getting an itch that I need to scratch, you know? And like, I want to be with a woman and you are not one. So you know, (laughs) like we need a solution here. (laughs) Yeah. We need to, we need to come up with something because I told you this at the very beginning, right? Like this is something that's not going to magically go away. Right. So he was very, very upset. Um, he had other issues too, but he was very, very upset and, uh, just was just like, you, you know, you want to do this. And I'm like, yeah, I think that's when he proposed. So like thinking that marriage would also put me in a, yeah. (laughs) And I was just like, no, no, it's not going to fix this thing. Um, or or how I am and how I want to be and how I want to live my life. And, uh, gosh, I'm so glad that didn't work out. Oh, 
Um, but, but yeah, that was a problem because there are some people who, like I said, just don't want to believe that you are a non-monogamous person or don't want to understand who you are or don't want to, um, just, they want to believe their own thing. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and especially if they're so used and conditioned and socialized that monogamy is the, is the way to be, then it's really hard for people to see outside of that box. Right. And that it sounds like his mentality in that was you're, you're, you're only non-monogamous because you haven't found that one person. And if I propose to you and we get married, I become that one person. And now all of the other ones are not needed anymore. Right. Exactly. And it, it sounds like for you, and I think probably for most people who are exploring non-monogamy, that it, there isn't going to be a one who fulfills everything. And I guess maybe are you able to talk a little bit about that, right? Because you said, you know, you were with yeah. him for probably some significant amount of time and and you hadn't been with anybody else. And then you said you started to kind of like get the itch, the, mm -hmm. the craving for something else. And what that, I think that's a feeling that a lot of people mistake as I must not love the person I'm with enough. So I'm, they're not enough They're This isn't the right person, but that it can be both. Yeah. I feel like, you know, different people offer us different things. And so we have to be able to understand that, like we are, um, and not everybody can fulfill everything for you. I mean, you know, maybe some people can, you know what? I, I saw this really great, um, sex therapist who was talking about how some people are squares and some people are circles and how the folks who are circles are great because they get all their needs met right on all four sides. But the folks who are squares still have these spaces that need to be met. Right. And I found that like, yes, right. Because there are some people who are, you know, in that relationship in particular, that one with him, I had friends who go, who went like, Marla, he is everything. Like you are everything to him, but you are, you know, you don't have like, he's not pushing you to be better. You're pushing him to be better, but you're not getting anything out of it. And you're not moving forward in your life. And I was just like, holy shit. Like, you know, and I was so happy that someone had the courage to tell me that and say like, Hey, fact number one, fact number two, fact number three, this, this relationship is not worth your time. Um, so now I totally depend on my mother for like all my relationship <laughs> advice because <laughs> she's just really good at it. But, um, uh, but yeah, like thinking about how those gaps are. And if we have gaps, like for me and my, and my wife, like I'm totally into kink, right? My wife is not into kink. Will she entertain some things sometimes? Right. But like, she is not going to be the one she's not going to be going to play parties with me or uh, she did one time, but though, but like, you know, in general, <laughs> like, um, so, you know, the way that I'm able to explore my sexuality is in a kink space. And mm -hmm. for me, that's very, very important because without that outlet, I would, I would feel stuck. Right. I would feel like I am not getting all the things that I need in my, you know, in my life, not necessarily in my relationship. My relationship is great. Um, but in my life, like yeah. I, I need these other things. So, right. Yeah. And that they aren't necessarily equated to relationship, right. That, yeah. that the, the kink or any other exploration doesn't necessarily have to be part of a quote unquote relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Do you mind talking a little bit about what non-monogamy looks like for you right now in your relationship? Yeah, so we are in a monogamous relationship. So that feels great to me because, like I said, my first love is my career. And, um, and so, uh, we have a great time, but we are also open to other sexual experiences. And that, so that feels really wonderful to me, especially because I don't have the like mental, romantic, 
capacity for other people. So I have like flirtation ships and I have like, you know, the people that I play with in, you know, in kink, you know, and I have these other things that are very fulfilling for me um, personally. And if, you know, my wife and I decided we wanted to be with somebody, I have, we have that option to do so without such a stringent, like you are for me and me only, you know, kind of attitude. And that's, that's important for me because I need to be able to like, what if I feel some t- what if I feel different the next day? Or what if I feel any type of way doing anything? So, um, someone having someone be there for me and supportive of all that I am is perfect. So very, right. very happy. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, it sounds like the, the dynamic is you two, by and large are monogamous, right? But you have these outlets and you have the freedom to explore, but it's not every weekend we're going. And to have those conversations too. Right. Yeah. And so it's just the openness of the, the communication. Right. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. We've definitely been places that I'm be like, don't you want to make out with her? Is she pretty? And she's just <laughs> like, no. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> but, but can I? <laughs> I'm always like trying to like, you know, like, Hey, <laughs> so is, sure she, along. is she fairly, I guess of the two of you, is she the more monogamous one? Is that a, Oh a, yeah, yeah, yeah. She is. Okay. She is very much. We are, we definitely have, we have some shared affinities, but we are definitely opposite. She's more conservative than I am. She's more, you know, sort of laid back. She's an introvert. I'm like an extrovert. You know, like, so we definitely have, you know, some polarizing patterns, and, but, you know, we come together in the things that matter the most in our values. And I, you know, of course yeah. that's the most important when you're in a relationship. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think maybe that's, again, if you're willing to talk about it a little bit, because we, I mean, honestly, we get emails from people frequently about, I really want to explore this. I think I'm a non-monogamous person, but my wife or my husband or my partner is very monogamous there there's no budging and how how have you two navigated that right it sounds like she's fairly open to allowing the exploration and maybe that's a piece that works but like how have you found ways to make this sort of um in balance work yeah so I wouldn't necessarily frame it in my relationship because I feel like my relationship is different. But with my clients, I have seen this a lot um, where someone is monogamous and the other person is like, I want to discover some non-monogamy stuff. And the monogamous person is like, no, that's not what I entered into this marriage for. Uh, That's not, you know, what we talked about in the beginning. If that was something you wanted to do, then you should have did that a long time ago kind of thing, right? Like I am very comfortable in this social construction of, what we have said works in society. Like I'm very comfortable with that. And then the non-monogamous person feels restrained, feels, you know, they become cheaters, you know? And for me that, Oh, that is a heartbreaking because I think we should always we should always listen to what pleasure means for us or like our into our gut, our hearts, our our minds. We should listen to ourselves and what pleasure is for us. And I believe we should all have the ability to act on that pleasure. And I think it's very difficult when someone in a situation like that goes, well, I think I've always been this way. So I think people deny themselves from the very beginning. They deny themselves who they are because they want to fit into this societal mold. And when you deny yourself or you deny pieces of yourself, then you cannot show up fully and authentic with someone new. And because they are expecting you to be fully and authentic in who they are. And so for my couples, can a person who's monogamous and non-monogamous work? Yes. I believe it can work if they're willing to be upfront and honest with each other. And 
have rules, right? So there are certain rules that you can have, like the don't ask, don't tell, or, you know, there's, there's so, there's a lots of different rules that you can put into your relationship that will feel good. And also you have to be ready for the repercussions, like yeah. to come out as non-monogamous in, in a monogamous state, you need to be ready for the repercussions of what that might be. And so the, I think handling that, go to a therapist, right? <laughs> go, <laughs> go, you know, talk to people. I often tell people who are interested in non-monogamy to go read about it first you know, read about it first, read for like a year, read, read, read. There's so many great books on non-monogamy. And if you read those books, you can get an idea of how you want your relationship to look. So I think talking with your partner about like, how do you want this relationship to look? Do you want it to look like we are the happiest couple to everybody, but then I can date on the side or I leave for long distance trips and I can go and have my relationship with someone else, you know, yonder, would that feel good to you? So where, you know, on the outside public fa facing, it's great and private it's, you know, we just kind of keep our lives or keep this part of my life separate. Right. Um, I, I think doing all of those things, just really just negotiating is the best thing that you can do. Uh, I just, for me, it's just like, just start off at the, if you could just start off at the bat, you don't have to go through all of the trouble of right. what it might be later on. Right. Well, and it's, and it, I think, you know, something you touched on right at the start of that is that there when you tell the part you tell your partner i think i've always been like this the other piece that hits them is then you've been lying to me yeah and now i feel deceived and so it's multiple things piling up on them at once right first exactly. of all I was, I was comfortable and now you're telling me that you've always known this and now you're telling you've decided to wait 10 20 30 years to tell me this right like that can be a really jarring thing yeah. And what else don't I know about you? What are the right. other things that if you kept this huge thing from me, what other things are there? And can yeah. I even trust you again? Because I don't even know if there's something else that's going to pop up and you're going to be like, I've always been like this. Right. So, right. Um, yeah. What if I work through this and all these feelings and then, you know, in a year it's something else <laughs> and something, you know, I should do it all over again. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to throw one other quick and we, we tend to not give tips, but I'm going to throw one out there on the, you, you said read for a year, right? Read about it, learn about it. And I think the thing you have to remember if you do that, and then you, so you've been reading for a year and then you go and you tell your partner, I've been reading about this thing for a year. You need to remember that it took you a year to read about it and to give them at least that much time, if not longer to read about it, learn about it, come around to the idea because you are, you're running a, a marathon and you're starting on mile 13 and they're on mile zero and exactly. you've got to give them time to catch up. So. Exactly. It reminds me of when I came out and then my mom asking me five years later, she was just like, are you, are you sure? You know, it's like <laughs> she was still in this process of catching up. Right. Like right. while I'm like full steam ahead. Yeah. Um, and I think that is absolutely important, giving them time. And like I said, going, seeking someone, talking to people and really having those conversations and warming up, you know, to this idea, warming up to what are the possibilities could be for your relationship. And, and, and honestly too, I'm just, I also say to my couples, if this is something that you really think you cannot do, then I think it's fair to say, I got to, I have to leave, you know, like if this is really not what you wanted, then, then you, you need to find someone who wants the same thing as you. Right. It, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I think, you know, something else that you touched on right at the end where you were saying, maybe it looks like this or like this or like this. And I think the other that, that I wanted to maybe reiterate was something you said earlier, which was everything in life is a choice. And there's not like you, 
you know, we've had whatever, 130 different dynamics on our show. That doesn't mean that those are the only 130 that exist and that you can literally build anything you want and create it and it can change and it can change yes. right? you can try it for a couple of weeks or a month or a year and if it's not working 10 like, years go back to the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, go back to the drawing board there's no there's no prescription for any of it yeah yeah uh, and i think that's really important to know is just be open you know try to be open try to be understanding try to be forgiving have some grace with yourself because we do change our attitudes towards things change, you know, all the time, our bodies change, we change constantly. So it's so, so important to think about. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I was hoping you could talk a little bit about is, uh, you know, have you, or how do you handle situations where you get pushback, I guess, against being authentically you and, you know, all of us, you know, that can be scary to come out and like be who, who you really are. And, and it, how, not that we're talking from experience here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how, how, what is, is, do you have some thoughts or tips on, on maybe getting, being ready for that, but also just handling those situations and, and moving forward? Yeah. I think you should always be ready for rejection. You know, I I think you should always be ready for what are the benefits and the consequences of my behavior. And if you don't think about the benefits and consequences of your behavior, for instance, if you're at your job and you have two lovers and you want to bring them both to the Christmas party and, you know, you have to say like, okay, what is the, what are the benefits of, you know, bringing both of my, you know, lovers who also love each other, you know, what are, what are the benefits of that? Well, I get to have a good time. I show people who I am, you know, people will get to meet my significant others and you know, that the consequences might be if you're maybe at an at will state, I might get fired from my job for, you know, the reason, am I, am I going to be okay if I get fired from my job? Am I going to be okay if, you know, you know, whatever the consequences that might happen, I think you always need to be prepared for whatever, you know, whatever the consequences are, whatever rejection you think you might uh, get. And also think about the benefits too. Cause a lot of times we think about all the doomsday stuff, but we don't think about the positive things. And I think that's also very, very important. So if I do come out, then I get to be authentically me. And then I also maybe can find a job that actually accepts me for who I am. Right. Or I get to, you know, whatever. And then you might just, I don't know, maybe even get a promotion because maybe the boss also has a mistress on the side and it's just like, (laughs) oh, I give props to you for having both in the room. Right. (laughs) So, you know, like you, you never know sort of what the circumstances might be, but always being prepared for the, you know, uh, I'm sorry, always thinking about the benefits and the consequences and then always being prepared for like what rejection might look like for you. And if you can handle that rejection, the more confidence we have in ourselves to be who we authentically are, the more the rejection just kind of fades away, you know, and, we all have a fear of being rejected, but how many of us have the resiliency to come out of that rejection, I think is the most, one of the most important pieces when it comes to that. So, yeah. Yeah. No, it's awesome. And I think one thing I just wanted to maybe throw out there is that I'm going to put a link in the show notes uh, for a TED talk from Tim Ferriss on fear setting, uh, which is sort of his systematic way of laying out, what are your fears around this and what is sort of worst case scenario? And if you come up against that, what does it actually mean for you? Cause a lot of times we, what, what we really fear is is much scarier in our brains than what would actually happen to us in real life. And so going through that and practically looking at it and say, okay, well, if I did lose my job, what does that mean? What, how do I recover from that? What those types of things. So looking at it, in a very practical sense can be very yeah. powerful. Yeah. I have to do that with my clients. Like what is the worst case scenario? Yeah. And yeah. then they're like this thing. And I'm like, okay, does that feel like a big deal to you? 
And, <laughs> and usually they're like, not really now that I say it out loud. I'm like, exactly. Right. right. So, yeah, yeah, it's, and it's not easy to do. And you, it, but it is, you know, facing that can be super powerful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, Agreed. Thank, thank you for bringing that up. Um, and, one one other thing, not that there's not many other things, but one of the things <laughs> that we love to, to to talk about is the the safety, the health and safety aspect of exploring non-monogamy. And maybe I mean maybe, maybe this can kind of come in two phases for you. One is the yeah, I'm at college and I have this ultimate freedom. So maybe how did you keep yourself safe back then? And how maybe how has it evolved and how do you do it today? Both your physical, like going out and meeting people and also just your sexual health. Yeah. So for me, my mother instilled in me, like I said, because she was a teenage mother, she was very much like, if you, when you are ready to have sex, like you, when you, when you're ready to buy condoms, that's when you know you're ready to have sex. Like having that, putting that sexual responsibility on me, like, okay, I'm ready. I'm going to do this thing. And and then I'm going to do this thing. Right. So that for me was just a huge lesson on making sure that I am always keeping myself safe and understanding what it means to have sexual responsibility and and taking um, initiative on what that looks like. And so for my safety, I have always um, used harm reductive methods such as asking. So like asking like, Hey, you know, is there anything that I should know about? Do you have any, you know, anything that I should know about um, as far as, you know, um, your genitals are? I do harm reduction methods as in looking at their genitals. I'm a big looker. So if you can't let me look at your genitals, then, um, you know, then I probably just don't want to be in them. Um, and I've also taken safety precautions such as like um, uh I have this um, thing, this thing I'm looking at is like the thing I usually like place, like well, I used to place next to my bed of just like safe sex supplies and things that are already ready. Um, if someone were to just, you know, if I were to be in a casual sexual situation. So for me, it's a lot about asking questions, you know, getting to know people. And, um, I think I have been, gosh, I don't want to be like, I've been burned one time, but, Um, I had someone who told me that they did not have, you know, any STIs and then ended up getting, giving me HPV, um, from a guy that she had been with. And so it was just sort of like, "Ah!" right. (laughs) Because, I ask those questions and I expect you to be honest and then you're not honest. And then you come back to me, you know, a week or two later and be like, actually this thing happened. And so that fortunately has been my only experience where I did have that conversation. And because I did not, take those safety precautions that, you know, I, um, ended up getting, you know, HPV, but, um, luckily it's the HPV that went away. Right. So, um, and I also want to, you know, touch on like the, the stigma that people have when, you know, they are, when they do have an STI, I think can be very difficult to manage. And I have had, I have had long-term partners who have had STIs and we've always, we always just act was safe. So right. I, um, so for me, it's just, a, it's a lot of questions. It's a lot of looking, it's a lot of, you know, taking whatever safety precautions I need to take. And, um, I like to be fluid bonded with my lovers. So I don't necessarily, I'm like, I am not going to have sex with you until you go get tested at the clinic. Like that's not my thing. I think that's great practice. Uh, I think I've just, you know, in my past, I've been very, very slutty. I just don't, just don't think that was e- like, even in my, like registered with me in a sense. Like I just, for me, it was just more about the asking questions and making sure that I did what I needed to do. Well, and it sounds like getting, trying to get to know people too, to, to hopefully get to that level where you 
feel like you can trust them. I mean, obviously you got burned with the one person, but for the most part, you know, you, most of us are pretty good judges of character if we can get to know the people a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think the thing you talked about, the stigma is huge too, right? And that it's, I think a lot of times people are ashamed to, I'm, I'm, you know, sympathizing with the other person you were with probably was afraid to bring it up because if they did, you wouldn't want to have sex with them. Right. But on the, on the flip side, if they had brought it up, it's not that you wouldn't want to have sex with them. It's just, you're going to do it in a, in a way that protects you and protects them and protects exactly. all of the other people that you love in your life. And that, that, you know, it's not a deal breaker. It's just, we change the, we change the script slightly. Yeah, exactly. And I think that is the, that is the thing is just saying like, Hey, it's not a deal breaker. I, right. I, but I would like to know this thing. Yeah. And, um, but like you, like you said, just people have that stigma of, you know, not wanting to say anything. So, right. Yeah. yeah and I think too, you know, pointing out that, that there are times when these conversations aren't a foolproof plan and it's a, a reality that we have to face is that there is a level of risk that we're all assuming in this. And that honestly, we assume, uh, probably a greater level of risk getting in the car and driving to the grocery store yeah. every day. Right. And that, that, in our daily lives. that there's very few things that don't have some inherent risk in them, but that, that this is, this is another one of those. Yep. Yep. That's yeah. why I say it's very, very important to understand your part and your in, in sexual responsibility and what that looks like, which also means you need to be educating young people at a very early age to make sure they know what sexual responsibility looks like and to use their voice in a situation, you know, in a sexual situation. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, for sure. Well, we'll give you in a second a chance to maybe talk about anything we haven't touched on that you want to talk about. But one of the questions that we love to ask people <laughs> is a fun one. We try to keep it lighthearted here and asking if there's a blooper that you would want to to share possibly to show that it doesn't always go perfectly. Yeah, that was exactly where I was going to go to. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, Let me tell you about, uh, so my wife purchased a sex swing for our anniversary and, uh, (laughs) the blooper that comes with that is, um, I, I, you know, I am five foot eight. Okay. She is five, maybe three or four, maybe five, somewhere <laughs> around there. And she hid it from me in the garage. And so I had no idea that it was even out there. Cause usually I'm like here in my office, like, you know, doing work. And so anyway, uh, anniversary, she brings it out and she was like, I think this is how it works. And <laughs> so she like, you know, gets in it and it's all, I was just like, I think there's some pieces that are missing. Like, I don't think this this is right. (laughs) And so um, she was like, no, no, you got it. You got it. So I I was like, okay. And I was like, and I think this is pretty small. I don't think this is made for people my size. Like, (laughs) so... (laughs) It ended up getting in it, but it was just like this very weird and like awkward thing. And it was just like, for me, it was hilarious just because like, we were like, okay, this is actually, this is not going to work. And so, um, yeah. Like this is it, more hilarious than it is sexy. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it was like, it was just like my legs here and this here. And I'm trying to like, it was just like, <laughs> this is, this is not, I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. Anyway, I ended up like, I, I was just like, there's something, something's not right about this. I ended up going in the garage, like maybe a couple days later and being like, there's a whole section that is missing from this one. <laughs> And she's just like, it didn't have directions. It came from China. I don't know. Like, it's just like, well, you did a good job for what it was. But yeah, anyway. But so maybe so did you it. get it all put together the right way? or did? Yeah, you... yeah, yeah. It's put together the right way now. And all the pieces are there. So yeah. And does but, it yeah. work much better? 
Yeah, we haven't had a chance to, we haven't, we haven't done it yet. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but it's all there is the point. It's all there. It's all there in our living room. <laughs> it's still there. It's hanging out. It's out of the bedroom now, but in the living room, fixed up and ready. <laughs> That's the best part. Yeah. It's in the living room too. <laughs> yeah. I actually, I was going to take a moment because I, when you said the story earlier about your, when you told your friend you were going to San Francisco and they said, be careful in the Castro, right? They yeah. reminded me of a blooper, a, a foot in the mouth moment I had. This was in 2007. I, we were in Australia and we, one of our next door neighbors was moving to San Francisco to go to school for the semester. And I, I still to this day don't know why I said this, but I said, I, I don't, I didn't say like, be careful. I just said like, oh, there's a lot of gay people that live in San Francisco. And I don't even know why I said it. Cause it doesn't matter. And she's like, okay, well I'll, you know, whatever, I'll be on the lookout. Or is it some, some <laughs> innocuous right thing? So she was moving there to be with her girlfriend and now they're married and have kids <laughs> together. And so I was just like, I don't even know why I said that's the thing to begin with. It was just like, <laughs> You think, I don't know. You were in college. We were in I college. I was young yeah. and stupid. You're like, so. this is a fact yeah. <laughs> I can give like, to you. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know. Welcome to America. That's yeah. <laughs> so, so that when you said that, I was like, oh, I can't. every time I think of that, I cringe. Like, how, <laughs> how stupid She I probably was. doesn't even remember. I hope she, I know, hope she's listening and she's like, hey, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well. Well, awesome. Yeah. Before we wrap up, we wanted to make sure you have a chance to like uh, to plug your the sex down south and anything else you want to talk about. Yeah, the platform's yours. For sure, for sure. If anybody wants to come and take classes or do any sex coaching, I do workshops and you can find them um, on my web, on my website, velvetlipssexed.com. You can also purchase my book there, Jess and I's book, The Ultimate Guide to Seduction and Foreplay, Techniques and Strategies for Mind-Blowing Sex. Uh, that just came out in April. Yes, yeah, super excited. Super proud of it too. And you can also, if you want to go to the Sex Down South, it's sexdownsouth.com. And you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, tweet, uh, Twitter, Twitter. <laughs> and yeah, I think that might be it. Sex Down South, Velvet Lips, Sex Ed. I think I got it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And all of that will be in the show notes too. Yeah. With links. So I'm just a quick question on Sex Down South. Let's say there's somebody listening who falls in the camp of, I'm non-monogamous, but my partner's definitely monogamous. Would that be a good, that's not necessarily a non-monogamy event. It's just a sex positive event that maybe would be a good like place to start or would it be overwhelming to somebody, do you think? Um, no. So we have all sorts of people. I would say half of our audience is non-monogamous and half of our audience is monogamous. And a lot of folks who are kinky, a lot of folks who are in, you know, traditional monogamous relationships, we have a, a gamut of people. The, the, the range is so wide. It's really, truly amazing. And it's not overwhelming because people are super friendly Super, super friendly. It's a, it's a place where love is cultivated. We really, it was born out of love, just love for everybody, love for people who share affinities and love for people who don't. We prioritize, you know, or uplift the voices, uh, the voices of folks of color, queer and trans folks, uh, disabled folks, sex workers, you know, anybody who falls in the margins um, traditionally. So we are, uh, it, that it, it's truly for everybody. And we really feel like everybody can learn from everybody. So if you are, we've had workshops on, if you're monogamous and you, and you have a person who's not monogamous. And so we've had workshops where couples have been to for that. So there's all sorts of things that you can, can learn from there, but, but awesome. yeah, everybody, all voices from the, all everywhere. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing and perfect. We're excited to come check it out too. Yeah, we're Yay. gonna make it there one of these years. Yeah, Yay. <laughs> absolutely. Good. Well, again, Marla, thank you. I mean, for everything, for talking to us today, for all of the work you've done, past, present, and hopefully in the future. So, thank you. 
Yes, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you at Sex Sound South. Yeah. (laughs) Have a have a wonderful Saturday afternoon and we will we'll be in touch. Okay. Bye. And we're back. Right? Yeah, we are. I was waiting for you to maybe (laughs) continue on. Thank you, Marla, for coming on the show and just being really vulnerable and sharing so many awesome tidbits and advice about really being your true, authentic self. Yeah. And honestly, for all the other amazing stuff you're putting out there in the world, yeah, we are in awe at the amount of work you do for the community. So thank you for that. And on behalf of everybody listening, they thank you as well. And go check her stuff out. All links to everything she mentioned in the show are found on our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. In the show notes for this episode, go check her out. Now, as promised, long-awaited discussion about how awesome our virtual meet and greet was last week. (laughs) You can't wait. Go ahead. No, it was awesome. I mean, we had, like I said, uh, and Rudely was cut off, we had... It was your idea to keep the intro short, by the way, which was good. (laughs) That's true. But then you just messed it up. Excuse me. We had about 25 people call in and honestly it was some it was just it was fantastic to see people getting along. We'd come back from the breakout rooms and they'd still be chatting and people would be giving each other shit and talking and giving us shit, giving me shit mostly. I don't know. I had a great time and I think everybody else did as well. So we are going to awesome. We're going to continue doing these every month. Uh, basically what it is is we get everybody together in a Zoom room. And then we use the breakout room feature to break people out and ask questions and let them get to know each other on a more personal basis for a couple of minutes. And then we scramble it up and do it again. And it's been working really well. We're honing in our our recipe. and And we hope to see you at the next one. So all of the information about how to join is at our website, Normalizing nonmonogamy.com kind of a mouthful click on that's what she said click on the meet and greet tab yes the next one is july 23rd it's going to be from 9 to 11 p.m eastern you can sign up now and it's ten dollars per logon that is correct and on july 29th we have our monthly patreon q a those are just a great way to build community and meet other people if you have questions maybe you're new to non-monogamy and you want to just get to know other people that is growing as well we're now up to usually somewhere around 15 or so people calling in for both the east and west coast login or calls so those are at uh, 9 p.m eastern and again at 9 p.m pacific on july 29th again information can be found on our website under the community tab and patreon The other quick thing is the next women's group discussion call, also part of our Patreon group, is on July 21st. It's going to be at 4 p.m. Pacific, which is 7 p.m. Eastern. And this is an amazing call. It's just a fantastic group of women. We usually have a topic, or we do have a topic every month that we discuss. And just it's a chance to connect and be around like-minded people virtually. Virtually. Virtually, which everything is virtual right now. Yeah, it's virtually true. (laughs) All right, well, one last quick reminder to head on over to altplayground.net and check it out. Sign up. You will not be disappointed with the amount of inclusivity, diversity, and... Sex-positive individuals, like I said Sex-positivity. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So check it out. You will find us over there uh, along with lots of other amazing people and lots of amazing other podcasters. Yes. Next week. Monday. Monday episode. Wow. <laughs> that, that was extreme. We have a super special Monday episode. Yep. It is a panel discussion. Uh, we are going to be there, but you will not hear us talk very much. It is going Basically to... Basically for like 30 seconds in the beginning and 30 seconds at the end. Yeah. So we're making up for it apparently this week. <laughs> Uh, It is a panel discussion hosted by Ruby Johnson, who is one of the co-founders of Poly Dallas Millennium. And she is going to have with her or with us uh, three other people who will be talking about uh, what, what we have titled State of the Union of Black Polyamorous Relationships in the Pandemic and Uprisings. 
This is not a Race 101 podcast. We want to make that very clear. As do they. But it is an incredible discussion, and we will see you all on Monday for that. Don't miss it. Come back. We'll see you then. Thanks, everyone, for listening.